Hi guys, tonight we're going to learn about periodic table geography. Be sure uh, before you watch this video that you guys read 19.3. Have your composition notebook out and ready to go. Everything written, written in red is going to go into your composition notebook as your flip notes for the evening, other than this little reminder right here. So let's get right into it. Roman numeral number four is periodic table geography. And we're going to start with our periodic table groups. So we separate our periodic table into three major categories. We have our non-metals over here on the right-hand side in green, including hydrogen. We have our metals all the way over on the left-hand side in the bottom of the periodic table here um, in blue other than hydrogen. And we have our metalloids that kind of walk that stair step down the middle. My metalloids pretend to be both metals and non-metals depending. Now let's get into the geography of the different um, rows and columns. The horizontal rows we call periods. So anything that runs horizontal, we call them periods and we number them starting at the top, one, two, three, four, five, etc. I remember that because at the end of a sentence, you always put a period and sentences run horizontally. So that's one little tool you can use for that. Now the periods tell us um, the number of electron shells possessed by every element in that row. So you look at the row number, for instance this one right here is row number five. That means that every element in this row, in this period, has five electron shells. So if you think back to Bohr, who we'll be talking more about in a minute, he proposed the model of the atom where you have multiple shells like orbits coming away from the nucleus and a certain number of electrons fits in each one. So the period number tells you the number of shells. It doesn't tell you how many electrons are in those shells. It just tells you the number of shells. Now let's go vertical. Those vertical columns we call groups, sometimes referred to as families sometimes referred to as families especially because they share similar physical and chemical properties. So if you're familiar with boron and how it reacts, then aluminum is probably going to follow suit and act similarly. If something reacts with boron, then it'll probably react with aluminum as well. Not always, but usually they have very similar properties. The coolest thing about the group number is that it tells us the number of electrons in the outer valence shell of all elements in that group. So we learn that the period number equals the number of shells, but the number of the group tells us how many electrons are in that outermost shell. Make sure to get all these notes down because we're going to be coming back to this in a little bit. So if you look at boron, aluminum, and gallium, they all have three electrons in their outermost valence shell. Okay, let's talk about the diagrams of the atoms. We have two diagrams we're going to talk about. One you've done a little bit of research on, especially those of you that researched Niels Bohr in the last class. The first one is our Bohr diagram. And the second one is our electron dot diagram, or we also call it the Lewis dot structure. But let's go ahead and start with Bohr. So Bohr proposed a model of the atom where we diagram protons and neutrons in the center of the nucleus. The funny thing is that came later because they hadn't been discovered when Bohr made this model. But the most significant part of the diagram comes with the electrons which move around the nucleus in orbits, energy levels, shells, or valence shells. Those are four different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, different textbooks, different teachers, uh, different videos are going to say different things, so you want to make sure you're familiar with all of them. But here's the gist of what you need to know for the Bohr diagram. Each shell can hold a specific number of electrons. So if we look at that first shell, right outside from the nucleus, so pretend the nucleus is that sun, we're looking at that first planet that orbits the sun. Uh, in that orbit, we can actually hold two electrons. So unlike the planets orbiting around the sun, there's only one planet per orbit. In this one, we have two electrons which orbit in that first energy level. In the second shell, we have eight. And in the third shell, we have eight. We know we have more than three shells because that's just one, two, three. We go all the way down to seven. But the rules after three change and we're not going to get into those. So you guys just need to remember two, eight, now, another thing that's important to remember is when we're counting electrons, 
neutral atoms always have the same number of electrons as protons because my charges cancel out. Um, and as far as you guys know, every atom is neutral. We haven't learned about ions yet. We'll be learning about ions when we get to chapter 22. Okay, Bohr diagrams. Let's do an example here. So you can go ahead and write example and write down B11. And if you remember from our isotopic notation, the B stands for boron, the 11 stands for my mass. And I can use my periodic table to figure out my number of protons and neutrons, but I tell you right here. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to put your nucleus down with five protons and six neutrons. So all 11 of those particles are going to equal my, my overall mass. In my first valence shell right here, I put my two electrons, and that fills up my first valence shell. So I'm going to spill over with my three remaining electrons to my outermost shell. So I have one, two, three, four, five for my total of five electrons right here. Okay, let's see if you guys can do this next one on your own. Again, boron is in period two, and it has two electron shells. The number of shells is equal to the period number. Okay, let's do beryllium nine. So go ahead and draw the nucleus. Go ahead and put my four protons and my five neutrons in there. Now draw your first electron shell. How many can fit in that first shell? Two. How many do I have left over if I have four electrons total? I have two left over. So those remaining two electrons go into my outermost shell. And it doesn't matter where you put them as long as they're in the shell itself. Okay, let's do one that's a little bit harder. You don't have to draw the particles themselves in the nucleus. You can just write 15 protons and 15 neutrons. And then let's go ahead and put my energy levels down. So we've got one, two, and three. So we've got two electrons in my first shell. We can fit eight in my second. That gives me a total of 10 that I've used so far. And that leaves me with five in my outermost shell remaining. Okay, let's move on to my last uh, diagram, which is my electron dot structure also known as my Lewis structure. The Lewis structure shows the number of electrons in the outer valence shell. And we're going to do my example of boron again. We've already done the Bohr diagram of boron. Now we're going to do the electron dot diagram of boron. So we've got B here. The B represents whatever element you're doing. If it has two letters, you write both letters down. You just use the chemical symbol. And then it shows the number of outer valence uh, electrons. So we've got one, two, three. And if you guys remember, boron is in group number three. Although if you look at your periodic table, it doesn't say three for that one. Depends on the periodic table you use. It's a little bit tricky, but the way that we're going to number it is we're going to number this one one, two, and then we skip over all these elements right here and pick up over here where it says 13 on your periodic table. We're going to call that 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You may even want to just scribble out the ones in front of 13 through 18, um, which I recommend you do so you don't get confused, so that when you're counting outer valence electrons, you make sure to read the 6 and not the 16. You can't have 16 outer valence electrons but every element in this group has six outer valence electrons, just like boron. Every element in this group has three. So I know your textbook numbers them a little different, but we're going to be referring to them as three through eight, not 13 through 18. Okay, again, for the electron dot diagram for boron, remember that each dot represents one of the outer valence electrons. So if you saw three, you know that it must be in group three. So that's one little trick you can use when you're trying to figure out what element is being shown. When you draw the electron dot diagram, you always want to start on the top and distribute, it, distribute one on each side as you move around until all the electrons have been distributed. Just a reminder, 
all elements in group one have one outer valence electron. So if you were to diagram any element in this group and draw a Lewis dot structure for it, it would just have one dot. Anyone in this group would have two. Anyone in this group would have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. These guys, as I said, we skip over them when we're counting and we skip over them because they're transition metals and they go by a whole different set of rules. Um, they have very specific rules and they're a little bit confusing so you're not really going to deal with diagramming transition metals until you're in high school. However, some of you guys may have chosen transition metals for your element project. So we'll be talking about them a little bit and you'll certainly see them in compounds that we deal with during labs and class, um, but we will not be diagramming them. Um, so you won't have to worry about that till high school. Okay, let's do a quick little bit of review here and see how well you guys know your stuff. What do you call the horizontal rows on the periodic table? Remember what comes at the end of a sentence? Those are my periods. What period in group is aluminum in? So go ahead and find AL on your periodic table and you can see it right here on the back. We're in period three, group three. How many electrons fit in the second energy level? So if you're looking at that second energy level, what's the most number of electrons that I can put in there? Eight. What do you call the elements that are neither metals nor nonmetals? They walk the line. We call those metalloids, and you can see them right behind here in purple. How many outer valence electrons does chlorine have? So remember, valence electrons is equal to group number. So go ahead and find the group number that chlorine is in. Chlorine is right here on the periodic table in group 17, but we call it 7, therefore my answer is 7. Draw a dot diagram of carbon. Go ahead and write a big C down on your piece of paper. Find carbon on your periodic table. Locate the group number. And the group number is going to be the number of dots that you place around carbon. Should look just like that. How about a Bohr diagram of neon? And we're only going to show the electrons, so don't worry about filling in the center with protons and neutrons. Just go ahead and fill up my first valence shell with two. Neon, having an atomic number of 10, means that it's going to have eight left over, and that's gonna fill up my outer valence shell. Now remember, neon is also in group eight, which tells me that that outer valence shell is gonna be full with eight. The inner shell thus must be full because you can't start filling up the second shell till you fill up the first shell. So there's two ways you could have come up with this Bohr diagram, using the geography I taught you or just remembering the rules about atomic number e equaling protons equaling electrons. Now neon's pretty unique because there's something pretty special about its outer valence shell. It's completely full and that means that neon is very stable. All elements in group 8 are stable and we call them noble gases and this is really important so this is the last thing you want to get into your notes here because we're going to be talking about noble gases a lot. Noble gases play an important role in understanding why elements bond and don't bond because being stable means that they're not going to need to seek out stability from other atoms so they're very unlikely to bond but we're going to learn about that in chapter 22. So for now Come to class, prepared to practice what you guys have learned, and hopefully we'll be really good at it.